Okay, uh, welcome. I hope everybody's had a, a great day at the Chicago Research Summit. My name is Jill King. I'm a librarian at the DePaul University Library, and I'm going to be moderating uh, this session. Just a couple reminders, please do remain on mute during the presentation. Chat will be open, and you're welcome to share any comments, questions, or feedback in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And um, we'll take questions uh, at the end of the session. So we'll get started right away. Um, I am very pleased to introduce our presenter, David Dolak, Professor of Instruction in the Department of Science and Mathematics at Columbia College Chicago. Welcome, David. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, um, the Chicago Research Summit, for uh, hosting my presentation. I'm really excited to share what, um, what I do with a, with a class of freshmen, especially a freshman class, um, at Columbia, where we do use the city as our laboratory and our classroom, um, sort of in line with what the, the whole research summit is about, I hope. So I hope you'll find the presentation um, enjoyable and useful, enjoyable, and then there's, a, there's live music at the end, so stick around, okay? Uh, so let me see here. Why is my, uh, okay, okay, I'm gonna use it, okay. So that's me. Um, you see me live here. I wasn't sure it's going to work, but that's with the hurdy gurdy. I build musical instruments. It's one of the things I do at Columbia College. Uh, I teach a course on the science of musical instruments. I'm an environmental scientist by professional background. I, I worked at Argonne National Lab for a number of years, but I also am a professional luthier. So that's my hurdy gurdy. It's not. That's not what I'm going to play. But um, so again, I've. I've the, got images I've grabbed and stolen from various places besides my own. So there we go. Um, the course I teach is part of the Chicago's uh, Columbia College's what we call the Big Chicago program. It's the all freshmen are required to take a Big Chicago class their first semester. It's really the only large lecture that we have at Columbia. Um, they they average around 100 students or so each, and we do get a couple of TAs to help out in breakouts. All of the big Chicago share, share these sort of three basic goals. It's like a welcome to college, you know, course, and, and understanding higher level work, et cetera, um, and in collaboration, doing research, et cetera. Learning to navigate Chicago during the time the students are going to be in um, Columbia, because a lot of these are, of course, students that are not from Chicago. They're living downtown in the dorms. And then use Chicago as our classroom of study uh, for whatever the topic is of the particular class. So, but all of these, all the big Chicago uh, CCX 100 classes share these three uh, goals. And then this is sort of the generic learning objectives for all of the uh, classes as well. I'm not gonna just read them. I mean, that's the worst thing of course in PowerPoint, but you can see it's sort of understanding the city. Use that for our exploration. Um, you know, we obviously we are very big on DEI at Columbia, and um, I'm trying to make the classes uh, as inclusive as possible for different learning styles. And we, of course, welcome everybody uh, equally, I certainly hope. And um, certainly, they'll hopefully like to learn about Chicago. I mean, it's a great city. Uh, there's a lot of really good things um, to learn about besides the immediate topic at hand. Um, oh, yeah, so I'm going to click here. Um, you know, the rationale for all the courses, well, to my course in particular, is Chicago is, and any great city is developed based on sort of the science, the geography, the geology, the resources that were there and available to the people who were settling the area at the time. Um, and then uh, that the bottom bullet point there is sort of a another general bullet point for big Chicago. Sounds very academic to me, but um, in my course, we're gonna be outdoors. We do a lot of field trips, so observation is important. Um, I want them to integrate their skills. Columbia is an arts and media school, so these are students with generally a lot of good arts sort of chits to them. There's musicians, there's fine artists, et cetera. Um, I'm a scientist by trade, so I do want you know, to have some critical thinking involved here. Um, they're gonna have, they're gonna document their work as you'll see later by um, a journal, uh, individual journal, and then a final project where they work collaboratively um, to do uh, some kind of a PowerPoint presentation on uh, one of the topics at hand. Um, specifically in my class, 
and you'll see this when I do my little topic lecture shortly, I want them to understand and anybody to understand really, Chicago cities develop for a reason. It's not just happenstance. I actually, the impetus for this course has come in the last decade I've given a, the talk much more expanded than the one I'm giving now, but on this general topic to libraries and various other institutions in the Chicago area in the last 10 years, I sort of put together a lot of research by other you know, scholars from natural history, human history, again, the environmental sort of ge geographic geologic side that I bring to it, to put together the story of how Chicago was founded. Because I, what I saw, um, you know, whether it's on Chicago tonight or you know, there's always experts in certain areas, but I don't never saw it put together in one sort of story here with the human um, rationale for a city as well as sort of our natural uh, resources. I think many people have heard the idea of the Chicago River has been reversed. How did that happen? You know, we didn't just let's reverse the river. You know, there um, there are reasons that it was eight, we were able to do that here in this specific place at the specific time it was done. So. If you look at these these learning objectives, it's really trying to be focused on Chicago and the, sort of the natural environment that allows a city and specifically Chicago to develop. And again, we're going to have the students try to be use their creative thinking skills, critical thinking. Um, since it's Columbia, they're going to be documenting this by writing and drawing as well and um, working collaboratively. So first thing I always do since it's a freshman course is this. Many of them at least do remember the movie. I was in college, yes, when this movie came out. So welcome to college students. You know, what is college? I mean, this is a big part of the big Chicago. It's getting them into college life, you know, and it's not high school anymore. Um, yes, you're here for a piece of paper, but you know, it's hopefully much more than that. You should have a good time. Um, it should be an important part of your life, and it's your choice, you know, that seems to me uh, something we need to emphasize there. Um, you know, you got to focus. You have a good time, but you have to focus. You got to take a lot more responsibility on your own than in high school. Maybe you summer, summer students are living at home, but of course most are not. Most are living in apartments or they're from other places. We, two-thirds of the freshmen live in our dorms. So, you know, especially coming back this year after having uh, last year being remote, this class was a hybrid, excuse me, hybrid class last year, which means I had, you know, half the class in, half the class out, and we couldn't do all the field trips. We were not allowed to go on the CTA, and so we were a little more limited. This year, we're back to being what we did. So anyway, but this is, you know, this is a big part of this whole big Chicago thing. Every week, we have, we introduce things about being a college student how to manage their finances, how to manage their class for upcoming classes and things. So that's why I wanted to include these slides here in the beginning. Now, the, the specific thing that I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk on is give you a little topic of what we cover. So again, the, my thesis is great cities are located for a reason, natural history reasons, there's based on the geology, the geography and the resources available and the technologies at the time. Chicago Portage, Portage is going to be a big thing to talk about here. It, it's very famous. It's the reason we're here. Uh, Native Americans knew about it long before, of course, the European uh, settlers came, but they actually guided them through it. And um, of course, this has led to the development that, you know, the great city we've known through a fire, which is, of course, the anniversary was 150 years ago last week, reversing the river and being one of the world's great cities. And of course, there's caused a lot of environmental changes that continue with us. So we'll hear, we'll hear a little bit about those. All right, Chicago, what's the history here? There's a map, road map. There's a satellite view of the Chicago area and uh, what's called a physiographic view that shows the elevation, sort of. And the central thing to focus on is this Y structure that sort of opened towards the east. Why is the Y the key to our whole story and why Chicago is where it is? It's due to the Y and glaciers. So just a quick review of glaciers. Um, um, 20,000 to 15,000 years ago, the last ice age reached its peak. 
and ice descended down from Canada. You can sort of see where it was accumulating into areas three miles thick, much like modern Antarctica. And it pushed down all the way to the Ohio River Valley. Chicago probably had 3,000 feet of ice. And what glaciers do, glaciers are very, you know, in geology, they are one of these sort of regular things move 20, 30 feet a day. Ice at that thickness is not like a brittle thing in your refrigerator. It actually, so it's sort of like the blob. So it moves, it grabs things, it grinds up rocks, it transports them. And when the glacier finally melts, if the climate has changed, then the landscape has changed. And the important things I just wanted to point out for further understanding of the talk is after a glacier has sort of reached its terminus point, it will leave a pile of debris. And it's the, the term is called a moraine for the structure, which is composed of something called till, which is just filled with everything from boulders to cobbles to pebbles to sand to silt to clay, all mixed up. Okay, and we have a major moraine that rings the Chicago area that is a big part of our story. So if you could picture this as sort of the glacier advancing during the height of the ice age, and then after it finally is melted back, we have a changed landscape with something like this moraine around it. The last ice age period reached its peak about 18,000 years ago. And this is the best we can sort of reconstruct the peak of that. So it went down about 150 miles south of Chicago. And then the climate started to change and eventually the glaciers melt back to the north. I mean, obviously it warms from the south. And at this point, you can see what happen. The glaciers actually, of course, dug out the Great Lakes, and so they start filling the Great Lakes. Uh, you can see Nash and Lake Michigan here and Lake Erie a little larger than it is today. But about 10,000 years ago, the water that's starting to fill up these basins overfills them, and the water flows in two directions in this way. And why is that so important in our story? Well, before, I'm gonna go ahead one slide and then I'll go back on it. Before the glaciers came, and there are geologic reasons we know this, um, this is how the water flowed in the middle part of the United States or the North America. You can sort of see these shadows. Those are low river valleys. They look a lot like the Great Lakes <laughs> because they were already low and the water accumulating from Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, what would become Lake Michigan, they actually flowed out, of course, this way through toward the Montreal to this uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. But during that period of time when the glaciers were melting and blocking that water flow, the water had to go this way. And in fact, that's what this set of slides shows. As the lake was um, retreating and the modern flatness of Chicago was becoming exposed, that moraine, known as, known as the Valparaiso moraine, the water overfilled it like if you overfilled your bathtub. It happened to break through in two places. And that's that Y structure that I showed you on the map. Um, for those who are from Chicago area, this is, this is 294, goes past uh, the big United um, Parcel Service. So this is in the Western Burbs and this is about 200 feet from the moraine down to where it cut through. And by the time humans arrived, first the Native Americans, the lake is in its normal situation about 4,000 years ago. And this area was no longer a big flood, but there was a river going through it. The Des Plaines River coming from Wisconsin flowed through the Northern part of the Y. So this is sort of the situation when people show up. And by 4,000 years ago, the lake is, the, the Great Lakes are at the set, uh, the size and the shape that we know them today and the basic flow of water from the Great Lakes is from Superior, Michigan here on out through Lake Erie, through Niagara Falls. You know, all the Great Lakes pour right over Niagara Falls here and then out they go. So that's the situation when humans arrive. But it's given to us by the glaciers. Now, importantly, because of all that water sloshing in the, the area when it, it had burst through the moraine, we are left with a very interesting situation of water flow. Immediately in the downtown Chicago and inside about Harlem Avenue, the water flows into the Chicago River or on the south side, the Calumet River, into the Great Lakes and then out to Montreal. But 
on the western side of the city where the Des Plaines River is, the water still flows into the Des Plaines River and goes out eventually to the Illinois and the Mississippi to New Orleans. So we have a divide. We have a continental divide, much like the one at the top of the Rocky Mountains. But this divide is the purple thing here. It separates waters going into the Great Lakes out to Montreal from everything in the middle part of the country, which of course goes into the Gulf via the Mississippi. This becomes a important bridge, but it's a, it's a divide. And of course, Native Americans have been using it for thousands of years because if you think about how the, how the transportation was, it was via boat, canoe. And uh, of course, the central thing, if you're in a canoe, is you wanna stay in the water as much as possible and not have to carry your canoe too far. And so the four or five miles where it was relatively flat, but it was the divide between waters of the Des Plaines or the Chicago River, it was a swamp. And this is where Native Americans for thousands of years, if they were traveling up from the Mississippi, they could you know, drag or push their canoes through the slob, the slop of the swamp to get to the Chicago River and get into Lake Michigan. It was the ideal portage and the best one in all the Great Lakes. Okay, so this is really what the glaciers gave us. This little four or five miles, relatively flat. You don't have to go up over the Rockies for a continental divide. Slop, you know, slug through a swamp. Maybe if it's a wet enough year, you could just paddle right through it. So the Americans have been using this for thousands of years. Well, the first Europeans given credit for coming through here were a priest, Jacques Marquette, Joliet, the voyageur, and they came through, of course, in canoes. They had Native American guides, and they are the first non-natives who came through this area. And it was in the summer of 1673. It's interesting. This is a map from the early 1600s. Again, the Great Lakes weren't even known yet by the Europeans when they're drawing these maps. You can see the outline of the Gulf and the East Coast, even Hudson Bay, but this is unknown. But by the mid 1600s, the French sort of were exploring the interior. And so there were a series of French forts on the Great Lakes and Joliet and Marquette in 1673, they took off in canoes with Native American guides from um, the head of Lake Michigan and they went through Green Bay. They were trying to get to the Orient. They really thought that the rivers would go west through here. They didn't know that it would go south. And, and of course their guides eventually said, well, no, this is going south to a very hot place. And they realized this was going to New Orleans. And the, at that time, the Spanish were still there and the French and the Spanish didn't get along. So they had to turn around. But instead of going the way they came, the guide said, there's a shortcut. If you go up this way through, which is the Illinois River. And Again, this is 1673. By 1680, this map is a French map. It already shows Portage of Chicago. Already the French traders who had been, of course, they were the ones interacting with the Native Americans for furs and for European goods like pots and things were trading. This turned out to be the ideal place to move your canoe from inland to the Great Lakes and back and forth, because it's only a few miles, as I showed in that earlier slide. So this becomes the most important portage in the entire Great Lakes. There's also a big wide flat area. And Joliet even knew right away that you could make a canal through here because they had done this in France. So that was gonna of course come later. Eventually the French of course lose in the Indian, French Indian War to the British, then they lose to North America. So by the early 1800s, we have a state, Illinois. And the idea of a canal, so you don't have to drag canoes through this portage becomes a likely possibility. Abraham Lincoln was a representative at this point, helped to get the money. And so the whole idea was, let's build a canal. You'd need to, you need to, dig that portage in the rivers a little deeper so you have water all year long. So the idea was to build a 90 mile canal from Chicago through the portage to where the Illinois River had enough water all year long to support, certainly not canoes, but as you can see here, canal kind of boats. So the i &M Canal was completed, hand dug by Irish immigrants in 1848. It was pulled by mules on the towpath, you know, and it, it that's what caused the explosive growth of Chicago. So Chicago was founded as a city actually in 1837, established. So by 1840, you got 4,000 people here. 10 years later, 
30,000. I mean, the, no city in history has grown this fast. By the time of the Chicago fire, there were 300,000 people. It's all because this opened up to boats larger than canoes, still being pulled by mules. Then the railroads come in, they follow the same path, um, but it was the canal the first thing. Of course, this explosive growth caused problems because when you have a city of a, almost a million people, and where, are we, where do we get our drinking water? Lake Michigan. If you're downtown, where did the water go when you had sewage? It went back into the lake. You can probably think this is not a good idea. And so there were waves of cholera and typhoid that would sweep Chicago. So by the end of the 1900s, new technologies were available, including dynamite and steam shovels, not just Irishmen hand digging a canal and the much larger and deeper sanitary and ship canal supplanted the old i &M canal, which was only six to eight feet deep. This was 25 feet deep and it reversed the flow of the Chicago River. You needed to go a little deeper and the water would just flow out. And of course, that's a much bigger canal as you can see than the, this depiction of the old i &M canal. And so the end result is that humans reverse the river through the north part of that Y structure. And then 20 years later, they did it on the south side um, through the O'Brien locks and Lake Calumet. Canada, of course, didn't want the Great Lakes to, incidentally, all this took our sewage and just sent it down to St. Louis and New Orleans. But we were bigger than them and there were no laws against it. And so for 20 years, our raw sewage was going down the Mississippi, yes. Eventually sewage treatment comes in and laws come in, et cetera. Canada, of course, doesn't like the idea of draining the Great Lakes. So there's treaties and there are locks now. There's a lock at Lake at Navy Pier and at Lake Calumet and it's limited how much water can go out a day. It's called the Chicago Diversion. It's maybe 5 billion gallons a day. I think we're all familiar when we have major storms, sometimes the water winds up going back into the lake and they close the beaches for a while because it's not raw sewage anymore, but it's still stuff off the streets. But anyway, that changed everything. It's, it's, a, it's a marvel of the world. The Panama Canal was uh, built on some of the lessons learned in digging the sanitary and ship canal. It was the first of this kind of thing. So it was, a, it was a wonder of nature. Reversing the flow of a river had never really been done before on that scale. So, and, and, but the thesis of my talk on this, a lot of people have heard this, Nature gave us a relatively easy way to do this. You only had to dig 20 or 30 feet through rock. You didn't have to dig through the Rocky Mountains, for example. So we reversed the blow of the river. What's the end result of that? Well, there's good, bad, and ugly. So the good, this is, a, this is sort of a death rates in the Chicago area, sometime 1850 to 1920. You know, heart attack, cancer, murder, they don't change. But it's this dark line here, typhoid. It peaks in the late 1800s, and as soon as the sanitary and ship canal is done, typhoid goes away because now we're drinking fairly clean Lake Michigan water and our sewage is not going back into Lake Michigan. Of course, now that we've connected waters that were never connected, animals that live in them can go back and forth between them. And of course, we had boats that come in from overseas because of the St. Lawrence Canal later. So we have sort of invasive species such as the zebra mussel, which got into the Great Lakes in the 1970s and 80s and now is in the Mississippi River Valley. And in the 1970s, people in the South imported these things called Asian carp um, to eat algae in the ponds in the South. Well, they escape, they get in the Mississippi River. And of course, now they're likely to get into the Great Lakes. And these things fly, they, you know, they're, they're big, they're, they're not in there yet. But so, you know, we've changed the environment for good and bad, but that allows us to have a city of, you know, X, X number of million people. Okay, so the, my, my class is heavily into field trips. There are five major field trips we like to do. Um, downtown, we do the Chicago uh, Riverwalk and the Michigan Avenue du Sable Bridge the Marquette building, and then two really neat parks on the south side. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about each one and why they're important to our story. Um, we get around by riding the L. That's a big part of big Chicago, learn to navigate. So we're in our masks this year, but we can at least be on the L. I'm gonna check my time, how am I doing? We nope. have about uh -huh. just five minutes until three. Okay, so let me run through and that could have a song. So these are some of our things. We can go to a real quarry on the south side. 
It's an old quarry. Believe it or not, there's a 300 foot quarry that's filled in now, but you can see the real bedrock of Chicago, the only place. That's our first trip. Students document this via journals. Um, we go to a park that has a whole history of Joliet and Marquette called Canal Origin, Origins Park, has these bas relief structures and they're required to of course collect information on them. The Marquette building is amazingly beautiful on Dearborn and Adams. It has a story of Marquette, Joliet and the natives. It's a little sanitized for how we look at things now, but it's a very historically important thing. And then they learn to try to uh, separate out what are some of the myths and what do we know now? But it's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, nearby, there's the, the old post, uh, post office has Chicago's rail. Uh, the uh, time zone started here. Uh, Fort Dearborn, of course, when we go to the Michigan Avenue Bridge, you can outline it. We go down to the underground Chicago, which is another part of our story. We can go to the Billy Goat Tavern. <laughs> cheeseburger, cheeseburger. The Bissable Bridge, they learn how to read maps. So it's a topographic map. That's a benchmark. They have to find this benchmark on the bridge. So there it is. So they can read elevations. And then we walk the river walk. And that's it. And there's plenty of history, the Eastland disaster, et cetera, on the river walk. Uh, they document their experience by a sketch noting, which is a combination of quick texting and uh, drawing. So there's one of my students at Colette last week out at Chicago Origins. And I have some amazingly beautiful work done. And of course, there's a rubric that they have to follow each site. What are they looking for? How do they interpret it? What's the overall story? They always have to incorporate maps into their journals, um, et cetera. So, and then, they, then there's a final project. They work as a group from each of the sites, groups of five. They have to incorporate some of their journals, but it's generally a PowerPoint presentation um, of the site. I'd like to go here. This is actually the National Monument, but it's too far outside the city that monitors Joliet Marquette. But if you're not aware of it, visit someday. So, any rate, yes, yeah, since I'm at Columbia and I'm a musician and a writer, um, I put together a song that I unveil new verses every week that go with the topics of the day. So, you'll get what you've just learned right now. <laughs> West and east, the waters flow across the portage to Chicago. Come and hear all the ice and the snow from the north. The glaciers go, they plow the hills with a grinding noise. Make the land of Illinois. 15,000 years ago, the ice stalled here below and then it melted back from whence it came, left behind the Valpo Moraine. Ice sheets melt in the lake's big bowl, spill through with a mighty glow, bigger than a thousand rains, carve the outlet for the displays. Low, low away we go, west and east the waters flow, across the portage to Chicago. Rains fall on either side of the continent's divide. Roll to the river or the sea. What will be, will be. Follow the water's flow from the north. The voyagers go, they cross the divide with the news. Paddle, push, and carry canoes. Ripple on the river's flow from the lakes to points below. You dig the trench with pick and maul. Barges float the INM canal. Two more verses. Low, low, away we go. West and east, the waters flow. Across the portage to Chicago. Well, flush away, the sewage goes into the lake. Oh no, so we dig deep to breach the divide and reverse the flow of the river's tide. Time proceeds and all now know that as we change our river so, some things are good, some things are not. Now up swim the flying carp. Low, low, three million, oh, their home on the shore. We know to the ice and the men the canoe so long ago, Chicago.
So <laughs> I will take questions if we have a minute, if Jill says we have a minute. Yeah, bravo, David, thank you. That was great. Do you get students uh, coming in humming that, uh, humming the chorus in the class? Yeah, it's probably yeah. a bad earworm for them, but they're every week they're ready for it. They're ready for new verses. And then the That's final great. week, all 12 verses are done. Well, great. Is there a question or is there a question or two for David before we wrap up? Okay, well, I, I, I thank you for attending. I thank you, Jill, and the Chicago Research Summit for giving me uh, the opportunity uh, to present what I exciting class that I think we have at Columbia for the freshman students and get them into college and learn a little bit about Chicago's history. Yeah, and I'm just amazed that you bring 100 students on, out on those, those trips too. That's, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, we we've, 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 we've figured it out. Um, yeah make sure nobody runs in. We can't all go into the Billy Goat at the same time, of course, but. Um, well, thank you again. Thanks so much for sharing your work with us. This was a great, a great session. Thanks uh, to our attendees for uh, being with us today as well. Thank you. And thank you. Okay. All right, Jill, thank you very much. Thank you, it was great to meet you. That was, that was an awesome presentation, thanks a lot. All right, thanks. Uh, I'll look forward to the links so we can see them. For sure, yep. Bye, All have right. a great weekend. You too, thank you, bye.